Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Wild Neighbor Speaker Series. This series is a collaboration with Travis County Natural Resources, who co-manages the Balcones Canyon Lands Preserve with uh, the City of Austin and a number of other private and public partners uh, who also co-manage the BCP as well. Before we get started, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Jaya Torres. I'm with the City of Austin's Wildland Conservation Division. Today, we're happy to have Viviana Ricardes, the Vice President for Texas Turtles, which is a nonprofit organization devoted to the conservation and study of turtles through research. Fueled by her lifelong passion for turtles and herpetology, she works tirelessly to study, document, and publish on the ecology and natural history of Texas turtles. After the presentation, Jeremy Hull with Travis County will manage the Q&A session, so feel free to put all your questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as we can afterwards. There's also gonna be a recording of the webinar posted on our Facebook page and YouTube channel as well. Uh, so the City of Austin Wildland Conservation Division Facebook and Travis County BCP Facebook. So on that note, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand it over to Viviana. Thank you guys. Everyone hear me okay? We'll get started. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited to be talking to this part of the state, to Travis County, to Austin. Um, like Jaya mentioned, I've been interested and fascinated with turtles and tortoises and herpetology since I was very young. And Austin was a place that really helped uh, fuel my enthusiasm for turtles and tortoises when I was really little. Some of y'all may recognize this photo. This is me as a kid. Uh, we were visiting Barton Springs one year and I got lucky and got to observe and hang out with this female Texas cooter, which is one of our Texas endemics, which I will talk about a little bit more. But it was a very big moment for me and a very uh, great interaction because of, you know, organizations like y'all and Austin and Travis County having these very amazing places in the city to go and interact and appreciate wildlife. So I found this uh, female Texas cooter there in the shallows as we were swimming, I was swimming with my family and I got to admire her and follow her and watch her swim along the Barton Springs. And I swam alongside her as long as I could till she finally disappeared into the deep end right under the diving board. And that's where I lost sight of her. So like I said, it was a very big moment, very cool uh, thing for me to be there in the city of Austin and getting to, you know, this adding to my, my drive for turtles and tortoises. So like she mentioned, my um, nonprofit is called TexasTurtles.org. We are a conservation ecology research, natural history based nonprofit. Um, it really simply started as um, our website, TexasTurtles.org, started back in 2007 by our president, Carl Franklin, and we became an official 501c3 nonprofit back in 2019. So all of our research, all of our work is all done through donations, fundraising, grants, that sort of thing. So why turtles? Why Texas? How did this all kind of come to be? Um, Basically, there's a Texas size hole in our knowledge of the turtle species here in Texas. Texas is home to almost half the turtle diversity in the US. So we are very lucky for uh, people like me, naturalists, those of us that appreciate the natural world, uh, lots of stuff for us to do and see here. Why turtles specifically? Well, many people don't realize, but turtles and tortoises are now the most endangered group of vertebrates. They have a very um, high biomass, which basically means that their impact and their role in our e ecosystem, in our waterways, in our ponds, lakes, streams. Um, people don't realize they see this neat or cute little turtle basking. Uh, they don't realize the big role that they play. Um, their role in the food web as predator and prey, they spend a lot of time eating plant matter or dead, dying, decaying, other decaying animals like fish, uh, kind of serving as a bit of a cleanup crew for our waterways. Um, they are prey uh, for many other animals bigger than them that can eat them. Uh, seed dispersal is a big one. Lots of people are aware that birds are seed dispersals. Well, so are turtles and tortoises, and they've got a very good, awesome impact for our ecosystem, for our planet. With that being said, 60% of the world's turtle species are facing extinction. That is across the globe. Um, things that we've all heard about from habitat loss, pollution, uh, poaching for the food trade, poaching for the pet trade is big, and then of course the human 
uh, turtle human interactions, things like road mortality, uh, getting hit by a car when they're crossing the, the roads, and things like trot lines are a big, um, a big thing that for turtles, fishing, uh, fish hooks, that sort of thing. So some things that, you know, are threats that face turtle and tortoises, not just here in Texas, but across the globe as a whole. We are very lucky. Texas has 36 different types of turtle species. That is a lot of turtles and a lot of excitement for folks like myself. Um, as you know, Texas is big, so that gives us a lot of traveling, a uh, lots of places to go and to see different turtles and tortoises across the state of Texas. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be sticking to a few of the species, specifically to Travis County, specifically to Austin, that you may see, might interact with, or might uh, come across. Texas has four endemic species of turtles, uh, which I think makes us very, very lucky. They are very pretty, very uh, unique turtle species. Endemic meaning found nowhere else in the world. And lucky for, for y'all in Travis County, there's three of them that live and call Travis County home. Starting off with the Texas map turtle, the Texas cooter here in the top right, the Guadalupe spiny soft shell, and just to the counties to the south of y'all, there's the Kegel's map turtle. Although it does not reside in Travis County, um, I will briefly touch on it for the purposes of this talk. But yeah, these are our Texas endemics. Let's start off with the Texas cooter. It is a large, um, hard-shelled turtle. They are very pretty, very vividly colored. Um, lots of striping and yellowing on the uh, head, face, neck, uh, chin. Uh, this beautiful bluish, uh, greenish eye to them, and they are going to be the predominant turtle species that you find in Austin, in Travis County, and the surrounding areas. This is their range map on the right uh, of what counties they are known from. Um, like I said, a really nice distribution and range across the state of Texas. Uh, they're found in the Brazos, Colorado, Guadalupe, San Antonio River systems. And like I said, probably going to be the main one that you see all lined up on logs. If you're out visiting Ladybird Lake or places like Bull Creek, Emma Long Park, they're going to be uh, probably the most common turtle you see. A good place to go check out Texas cooters up close and getting to sit right next to them and that are pretty acclimated to humans watching them are the Texas cooters that live at the UT Austin Turtle Pond. This is what they look like hanging out on a log, just doing their thing there in Austin. Here's what uh, one looks like swimming around, hanging out, uh, doing their thing. I mentioned that they are a large hard shell turtle, a very oval uh, shell shape to them. Uh, some of the terms and some of the words that I'll use for describing the different turtles is the word carapace, which refers to the shell or the top of the turtle, and then the plastron, which is the belly or the underside of the shell. So this is a large female Texas cooter that we found out um, one year crossing the road. I said lots of olive greens, uh, some dark coloration, some intricate pattern to them. The plastron is a soft yellow creamy colors. Lots of the underside of the edge of Texas Cooter will have this beautiful orange or even a vivid bright reddish color to the underside of them. Moving on to the Guadalupe spiny soft shell. This is an endemic subspecies. Its counties are the ones here found in red. So Austin, Travis County, those surrounding counties. And why are they called a spiny soft shell? They don't have spines or anything that's going to poke you, um, but they have this sandpaper-like texture, these bumps, roughness to the back of their shell here. They also have a row of bumps or tubercles along the top portion of the carapace, and um, some of them are more prevalent than others. They are the only turtle with lips. So here's an example of a spiny soft shell with lips. There's its beak right here in the middle and its snorkel-like nose. Um, they are the big uh, pancakes, the swimming pancakes, kind of like these super fast little flying saucers of our waterways. They've got the snorkel-like nose so they can remain mostly submerged or hang out under the sand for protection and stretch the long neck out, that long snorkel-like nose up at the top of the water to get a breath of air. They are a dimorphic species. Just about all turtles are dimorphic in some way. 
in the case of the spiny soft shell, females get much larger than males. This is about the size of um, the turtle on the right where a male will max out at size-wise. So if you're in Bull Creek, or if you're in Austin, you see this big, huge uh, soft shell turtle swimming along or out basking or out going to lay eggs, it is likely a female. These really, really large soft shell turtles are females. Onto the Texas map turtle. Very vivid, very cool, definitely a favorite of mine. Uh, the Texas map turtle, why are they called map turtles? Their skin and their shell looks like that of a topographical map. They are very different than the other turtles. They, they overall are much smaller. This is a female. They have a hard shell, a hard carapace and plastron, um, more of a keel and a very different shell shape overall to this turtle species. Lots of oranges and yellows and bright colorations and patterning through their sh um, throughout their skin. A white iris that can um, help you differentiate them from other turtles. These three significant chin spots on the underside of the chin here. Here's an example of a baby. Um, overall, very different shell and look um, like than, than those of the other uh, turtles in, our, in Texas. And they're in the bodies of water that form up the Colorado River system. Like I mentioned, Travis County, up to Tom Green, Lampasas, Burnett. Here's the range map of the counties that they're known from um, here in red. And this is an example of a female Texas map turtle out swimming, enjoying the day in Bull Creek. The males um, also dimorphic. Males stay much smaller than females. A lot of people will confuse them as for a baby or a juvenile, but males are overall much smaller, but still possess all those very unique Texas map turtle identifiers and patterning and this beautiful splotch um, called post orbital splotch or um, coloration and blotch behind the ear here. And then a close-up example of a baby. Um, here you can see the three chin spots and a very different, intricately patterned, uh, different shell shape baby Texas map turtle. Briefly mentioning the Kegels map turtle, like I said, is not found in Travis County, but can be found to the county south of y'all. Um, has a very small range, not a ton is known from them. Some recent research has kicked off this last year, so more to come uh, for this map turtle, but if you're in these counties south of y'all and you're hanging out on the rivers, waterways, there's a small chance you can come across a Kegel's map turtle. Moving on to the mud and musk turtles um, found in Travis County, the common musk, uh, eastern musk, also were known as stink pot. These are just a small uh, turtle. They kind of look like little moving rocks. Um, across the shallows or in the waterways. Uh, found in Bull Creek, Lady Bird Lake, everywhere in, in Austin and surrounding areas. They've got a pretty good distribution across the state of Texas, all these counties in red. And so they've got a pointier nose that can be very covered in algae or smooth and lack um, algae. It just really kind of depends on where they are. Um, they have what we call a reduced plastron, which is a much smaller plastron than their shell. They had a good little long neck to them and a pointier, bit of a pointier nose. Uh, many have this, these, these beautiful yellow markings along the side of the face here. Here's another example of the plastron or the belly of a musk turtle. And then a smooth oval, like I said, this is about how, where they max out in size as far as being full grown. The babies, the hatchlings of um, common or eastern musk turtles are very, very tiny, but can be found hanging out if you're in Ladybird Lake. Um, people found them paddle boarding. They kind of look like these little black acorns swimming along. They're very tiny, um, mostly all black with some of this white yellow coloration to them, this like, more of a keel to the shell, and just overall very tiny turtle. Here's an example of the plastron, and I'll show you all more on the, the bellies and comparing these, these two turtles. This is the yellow mud. So from the same family of the musk turtle, but maybe one that you may not interact with, not commonly as, as, as found, uh, you'd have to really kind of luck out to find one crossing the road. Maybe after heavy rainstorms, they do prefer cattle ponds and stock tanks, those type of things. And they have a very unique ecology as far as staying underground during droughts and, and staying uh, pretty cryptic. So they've got a different, um, overall coloration and shell shape, some yellowish to them, some can vary to this olive green, brownish color, 
Um, also a small turtle, like this is about as, as how they max out size wise. The very unique thing about yellow mud turtles is that they have this hinge, what we call is a hinged plastron, meaning that this front part of the shell, the belly can close up on itself a little bit to help protect them. Um, not as much as a box turtle, they can't completely seal up, but they can close up a little bit away and they kind of look like a little bit squished. It looks like you took it and took a mud turtle, mud turtle and squished it. And it's kind of got the squished uh, shell shape to it. All turtles, specifically mud and musk turtles, especially being getting the name musk turtles, excrete, excrete the stinky, uh, foul smelling odor from the underside of the bridge here. This is the bridge of the shell. So the underside of the shell, this stinky, foul smelling odor. So people will pick them up, try to help move them across the road or look at them and get this woof of the stinky uh, smell. But like I said, all other turtles have these glands as well. They're just very pungent on these little guys. So let's say you're in Austin County, you're trying to figure, Austin or Travis County, trying to figure out if you have a yellow mud or a common musk turtle. Here's the side-by-sides of what a yellow um, mud turtle looks like. This bigger plastron, this hinge plastron, this different shell shape next to that of a common musk turtle, a reduced plastron, and overall very different head. Um, there are other mud and musk turtles across the state of Texas. These are just the ones um, that you come across in Travis County specifically. On to the common snapping turtle. Um, everything's a snapping turtle. It's a very frequent thing that people find a turtle and they think it's a snapping turtle. The common snapping turtle is going to be um, a, the largest turtle you have in your area. Uh, they've got a very wide distribution across the state of Texas. They also have this smaller or reduced plastron on the belly here. And that's kind of what one looks like uh, peeking out at you from the water. So they do have some feistiness to it. They are pretty cute, pretty interesting, um, kind of can be kind of gnarly. Uh, definitely have, uh, get the name snapping turtle for a reason. Uh, people will come across them crossing the road. They do rear up on their back, lifting the top back portion of the shell up uh, in this defensive behavior and people will go to approach it and they do have a very long neck that will shoot out and um, deliver a very scary or kind of frightening uh, snap um, to, to get you to back off. But just kind of you can leave it and let it go on its way and it won't ever um, attack you or come at you if you're um, out paddle boarding or kayaking or tubing or swimming. They very much will get away from you as fastly, as quickly as they can. Um, common snapping turtle versus an alligator snapping turtle. Lots of people find a hatchling common snapping turtle or any snapping turtle and just think it's automatically an alligator snapping turtle. They're two very different turtles. Uh, the alligator snapping turtle here on the right, um, the range, and they live and are known from stick to East Texas. That's their natural range. Uh, so it is pretty unlikely that one would be in Austin, but it's possible if someone were to release one there or release one that they had tried to keep as a pet. Um, very different looking. The alligator snapping turtle has these really distinct, sharp looking ridges, uh, much a boxier, heavier head, a much shorter neck than that of the common snapping turtle and this kind of very pointed, uh, sharper beak um, to them. And they get much, much larger. They are this, the alligator snapping turtle is the largest uh, freshwater turtle in the Western hemisphere. The common snapping turtle is what you're gonna find in Austin and the surrounding areas. Here it is as a baby, like I said, a much smaller head. They're gonna have a much longer longer neck. Um, they also have a bit of a three keel, these three ridges to them, but that mostly fades out and um, grows out as they get older. So this much larger oval shell and probably one in the Austin area can max out, you know, around uh, 28 to 30 pounds uh, for a common snapping turtle. So they stay much smaller than that of the alligator snapping turtle. So the common snapping turtle is gonna be what? you would possibly uh, come across in your area. Here's another side-by-side -side of the common snapping turtle and an alligator snapping turtle. I said much smaller head, very different overall uh, shell shape. Here's what not to do if you come across and are able to handle a common snapping turtle. And this was the known way for many, many, many years and published in books on how to hold a common snapping turtle. Now we know that it's definitely not a good way to hold a turtle or to hold any animal turtles and tortoise, specifically the vertebrae or the spine of the turtle 
runs along the underside of the bone of the carapace here. So it's fused to the, to the back and that extends all the way down to the tail. It's basically an extension of their spine of the vertebrae. So holding a turtle like this, um, be pretty dangerous and painful to the common snapping turtle. If you're brave enough to want to be able to help one or move one across the road, it can be pretty simple. You can quickly but securely grab the back two legs so they don't scratch you and quickly gently moving them across the road. It is pretty simple. Uh, these are some young kiddos that have mastered uh, holding and helping common snapping turtles cross the road pretty easily. You can also put your hand under the belly, under the plastron and move it that way. They are kind of powerful, like I said, can be pretty feisty, but if you move in a quick, temporarily short, secure hold by the back two legs or even throwing a towel over it, some people use a shovel to scoop them across, uh, things like that, but they are known to be pretty feisty. And then here's another close-up of the baby common snapping turtle. Um, very cute, very adorable, smaller head, longer, uh, longer neck. And then um, here's one peeking out of the water uh, if one's looking out, looking back at you. Onto the red-eared slider, a very common, uh, widely distributed uh, turtle native to Texas. Uh, redder sliders are an invasive species in most parts of the U.S. and across the globe thanks to the pet trade. People will try to keep them and keep them as pets and then can no longer care for them so they release them and outside of their native range. Even if you have a turtle it's never a good idea to release a pet into the wild, never good to release anything out into the wild. Um, but they're native here in Texas and I think everyone at some point in their life has interacted with a redder slider or um, has, has seen them out basking. Like I said, very um, common turtle with this distinct red ear, this red blotch post-orbital stripe. Uh, they can be pretty vivid in coloration. Some can be softer colors. They vary uh, quite differently across the state and um, across their range. Uh, but overall, another big hard shell turtle with this distinct red ear. Here's an example of a baby. Many people have come across or interacted or seen a baby red or slider at some point in their life. Uh, they are mostly very vivid green when they're little. They've got a very intricate pattern um, as a hatchling. So when people are trying to figure out if they have a baby hatchling Texas cooter or a baby hatchling red or slider, checking out the plastron is a good quick way if you don't wanna wait for it to poke its head out and show if it has a red ear or not. A really cool thing, uh, for redder sliders is that when males uh, mature, they undergo this color shift and become melanistic. So they darken in color and they lose that distinct red ear. They have a variation of melanistic looks to them from brown, olive greens, to pale, all the way to really dark black. Here's a melanistic male slider that you can see is losing that red ear. He is becoming mostly black in the face and in the skin and his shell has taken on this really unique, distinct shape. And um, this is probably the number one question we get on our Facebook email across the board, um, questions asked of what kind of turtle it is, because it can be kind of hard to identify them when you don't see that red ear and they look so different than, than other turtles. Um, this top row are all male red or sliders. These are already undergone that melanistic color shift, taking on this unique pattern and coloration. Here's a younger male that is not yet um, become melanistic, but you can see he's got that same shell shape as these guys up in this top row, as opposed to a large female red or slider here in the bottom, who's much larger than them and still retains those very significant red or slider colorations and patterns to her. This is another variation of a melanistic red or slider. Sliders and lots of other turtles will uh, absorb tannins and get this tannin, not absorb, get this tannin kind of stain uh, to their shell. This is kind of like uh, tannins in the water, some minerals, mineral deposits on their shell and kind of make them look this rusty color red, which can add to the confusion. So this is a melanistic slider that has some uh, staining on the keratin shell plastron of this melanistic slider. Here's another close up of a melanistic slider. And these photos on the right show a younger male redder slider on the bottom that has yet to go undergo this color shift, but still the patterns, you still kind of make out the pattern as opposed to the male on the top that has already undergone this color shift of a couple side-by-sides of a younger male versus an older male slider. 
And then here's one that has gone a uh, completely melanistic, turned very black, and just this really beautiful dark colored turtle. And it's a pretty common and uh, good chance of you seeing um, them at some point hanging around in Texas. So some of the top questions we get and things that you will come across, especially this time of year, is why are turtles crossing the road? Uh, this is the year for nesting and mating and um, all that turtle behavior. Um, typically, uh, you can find females crossing the road. They're going to or from nesting. Some turtles will be out moving from one area of another looking for a mate. Um, they'll be moving from one body of water to another, maybe one stock pond, one cattle tank from another. Um, as one dries up, they go looking for more fresh water. Uh, females have a higher risk of road mortality because they're going out and laying eggs and trying to find a decent place to lay eggs. It's uh, common they get hit um, hit on the road and that way uh, box turtles have a very small home range so the good rule of thumb for just about all turtles and tortoises is helping them in the direction they were going and the direction they were pointed. Um, Sometimes we do have to make an executive decision. Always make sure it's safe for you to stop and safe to help a turtle cross the road. Importantly, you and others, and especially all the other drivers. Um, if you're safe to move them across the road or you're able to try and help one, but there's a cement barricade or there's some other really big um, thing in the way, putting yourself and the turtles in danger, um, it's use things like Google Maps to find the nearest creek where it may have came from and to find the nearest creek, you know, where it meets up on the other side to kind of help them that way. So always remain cautious when, when assisting uh, turtles crossing the road. So for example, nesting. Um, this is a frequent question we get and a lot of people will find or stumble across a turtle digging a nest, um, trying to lay her eggs. If you come across one and this, the nest cavity is still open hole like this, uh, she probably didn't lay eggs or she decided to change her mind, moved on. They do do a dummy nest or a test nest for whatever reason, change their mind um, and just kind of leave and abandon it like this. They will carry water in their bladder to soften the area around in the ground around where they want to nest. And so they leave this kind of muddy, frothy um, area, but some people will help a large turtle cross the road and all of a sudden this water comes gushing out of them and that's the water they're using to help, help them make a nest. So we do get a few, a few calls of what to do if they have a turtle in their yard laying eggs and they want to protect it. So first, if you see that looks like she's done, um, completed her nesting process, they leave this a lovely muddy, kind of a mud pie, muddy space. Uh, spot on where she lays. So if it's covered and sealed off like this, where she sealed off the nest cavity, there's a good chance she um, laid eggs. And you can stop there and think and assume, okay, I have there's there's eggs and there's a nest in there. For the purposes of this, this is my neighbor's yard. I did open it up a little bit just to peek down there to confirm that there were eggs, and I immediately covered it back up and left it and began to protect it. Uh, people always say, if you're able to do it, if it's in your yard in a place where it's safe to do so, um, we suggest using things like hard wire mesh. Uh, this is a fire pit cover that I've learned that can work really, really well. And I use tent stakes to secure it to the ground and you crisscrossing it. Uh, you want to think and make it anything raccoon proof because raccoons and predators get to them pretty quickly. Uh, you can always reach out to us and email and I can help talk you through any of this more in detail. But hard wire mesh and things like this typically work very well. And it's approximately 60 to 90 days for incubation. And it kind of just depends um, as each species and how things uh, play out. This is an example of predated nest. Like I said, within 24 hours, even sooner, um, raccoons or animals will eat every single egg um, in the nest. So those people that have been able to protect it, this is again my neighbor's yard where I was able to do this last year, um, 60 to 90 days. Come 90 days, if you don't think you're gonna be around to continue to watch to see if any babies pop up under here, you can remove it and just you know hope for the best that they all come out after a nice heavy rainstorm and play it safe that way. Like I said, not just for predators, but of course people mowing lawns, um, this helps protect it that way as well. Sometimes, uh, a nest and the eggs are completely infertile. This is what happened in the case in, in my yard. Um, many days had passed, we had kept watching it. And so I gently, gently started poking around to see if I saw any live babies. 
and all of the eggs were infertile and that's just, that's just how it goes. Um, you can gently, very gently dig around to see if you find any live babies in there, but it is pretty common that the babies will stay overnight, say over season, over through the winter in the nest chamber and then pop out in the spring after the heavy rains that we get in the spring. So, so you can always remove the nest cover, leave things be and hope for the best because you could have any type of situations and always feel free to reach out to us. So baby turtles are very, very cute. Uh, we got lots of, of messages and emails of finding a baby turtle and what to do with it. And people and kids want to keep it. And it really, really is in the best interest of everyone, and especially the turtles, to leave them wild, help them to the nearest permanent body of water, creek, stream, um, in the vicinity of where you found them. He like said they're adorable, but are incredibly diff difficult to care for in captivity. We do see people with the best intentions wanting to hold on to a baby for to let it get bigger and to let it grow a little bit to give it a better chance of survival. This can have its um, adverse reactions for many reasons. I mentioned it's very difficult to keep uh, these turtles, especially these larger turtles in captivity. This is a photograph of, um, that we'll see of many urban ponds or waterways of a turtle that was released that was either no longer cared for, they try to keep it in captivity too long, and it really added to the defor deformities and the shell to be really deformed. This is the keratin layer of the shell, kind of all messed up, this pyramiding, this lumpy look to it, which really um, doesn't help them a bunch. So as soon as you find them, releasing them is going to be um, the best bet for them. Here's an example of a, of a Texas tortoise that someone, I guess, at some point had found, probably very little, was very cute, very adorable, thinking, oh, it won't get that big, lots of myths um, in regards to keeping turtles and tortoises anyways. Um, this caused metabolic bone disease, and this pyramiding and this lumpy look to them is not normal. Um, so now this Texas horse could never be introduced in the wild, back, back into the wild. It is extremely compromised, even though someone had the best intentions of wanting to take care of it, didn't work out so well and so said very much leaving the wild things wild. My slide wants to move here. There we go. Here's an example of a three-toed box turtle. This is a normal box turtle on the right and again one that someone had tried to keep with improper care, improper husbandry, and um, did not end well for this box turtle. There's a huge myth that goes around. I've heard this my whole life, that turtles only grow as big as the tank or enclosure you keep them in. That is absolutely not true. It'll just cause severe deformities and compromise the turtles greatly. So that myth is absolutely not true. They need much larger, very much um, extensive care, which is always best to, to leave them wild. Things like turtle versus tortoise, a lot of people understand that there's a difference and some people may not realize that tortoises, the land dwelling tortoise is very different than that of a turtle. And we have seen cases where people will take a tortoise and try to dump it in the middle of the lake or pond. Uh, thankfully the tortoises do, can float, can swim, can typically sometimes get to safety, but there's a chance of them drowning. So we only have one native tortoise here in Texas, this Texas tortoise. And as you can see, it's just overall very different and well suited for living on land. The feet and the um, overall shape of how it moves. Uh, the This Texas map turtles and freshwater turtles all have this more webbing paddle-like feet for them to maneuver quickly through the waterways versus um, the land-suited Texas tortoise. I'll mention Texas tortoises brief, briefly uh, because there is a chance you could interact with them or come along um, come uh, come across them. They are do not occur naturally in uh, Travis County, but to the counties to the south here in red. Um, they are protected and they're the smallest uh, tortoise in North America. We've got quite a few and come across introduced species and it's a question we get pretty uh, frequently. Um, there's the yellow-bellied cider, which is this photo here in the center. Um, that are commonly sold in pet stores and people will some that can no longer take care of them and they end up leaving them and dumping them um, in our waterways. Uh, the African spurred thigh or sulcata tortoise, this photo here on the right, uh, people will uh, confuse them with Texas tortoises. 
Florida red belly turtle has been known to show up as a released pet, pet in Austin or uh, Travis County. And then the Russian tortoise. These are commonly that you might come across that we have seen people uh, mistake them for Texas tortoises or mistake them for our native turtles here. Here's some detailed information on a Texas tortoise side by side with a Russian tortoise or an African spurred thighed tortoise, a sulcata tortoise. Um, if you're curious in any of these um, infographics, you can feel free to email, email them and I can um, email them out to people if you want to see them side by side. This is a yellow belly slider that I spotted there at the UT um, Austin Turtle Pond. They are related, closely related to the our native redder slider and have the risk of hybridizing or um, integrating, mating with our native um, redder slider here. So again, never good to release a pet into the wild. Here's um, another example of metabolic bone disease and improper care of a sulcata tortoise. Since they are a popular pet, um, they do get confused with Texas tortoises because they um, can get rather large. Here's an example of pyramiding. And people will think that they come across a Texas tortoise when really it's somebody's escaped uh, sulcata tortoise. And again, another detailed example of uh, improper cared for box turtle that was perhaps once wild and tried to be kept as a pet. Um, overall, I mentioned that turtles and tortoises don't make good pets, especially keeping wild things wild. Uh, they look very cute and um, adorable when they're little, but I think anyone has seen this type of infographic at some point. Um, if you can't, they are very long lived. Uh, they don't do well in captivity, so refrain from buying or trying to keep anything in captivity. There are turtle rescues, and a lot of these turtles are highly um, turned over to rescues or dumped in the wild because people can no, cannot care for them long term. A couple myths um, when it comes to the common myths that we get and questions we get that snapping turtles or turtles eat all the fish in the stock or tank or cattle pond. That is absolutely not true. Um, they do eat some fish. They do are like the cleanup crew eating dying dead fish, fish that are already compromised or already dying. And so it's um, they really play an important role that way, but they will not eat all the fish. If fish in an area all completely die off, there's probably another reason for that. Goes into this, some people will see an area and think that there's too many turtles as of right now. We don't know of that actually being the case. In these waterways, they disperse and they go and they move from different areas and they don't, they rarely stay all um, together like this. Turtles will, you know, gather around and come when they're used to people feeding them and throwing out bread and pellets and stuff like that, but haven't yet to seen an issue where there's such a thing as, as too many turtles. Another cool fact about turtles that people don't know is that everybody talks. Turtles talk to each other. They communicate to each other. We can't hear it. They can communicate amongst each other. Even when they're hatching in an egg, they send out chirps and signals to the parents in the water. Um, really, really neat on that they can communicate and talk. And we don't know what they're saying, but they have a different um, variations of squeaks and squawks and different sounds that they make. Another part of our work as an organization is that we do lots of long-term po population monitoring studies. We have a lot of opportunities for volunteers and cities and science and biologists and people that come out and help us with our research, with our work. This is just one year's worth of turtle surveys uh, from this past year. Lots of really, really great volunteers. We have a really amazing crew and a really amazing group of landowners that we work with um, to get all this awesome turtle information and research done. Here's our website, texasturtles.org. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And with that, thank you guys very much. This was very awesome to be talking to uh, this part of the state. And I think I have a little bit of time for questions. I have to end my screen. Thanks very much, Viviana. Um, I'm going to put some links in the chat, some resources um, that you guys can access, and I'll hand it over to Jeremy for Q&A. Awesome. So, so much good information there, and I think I will forever call soft shells swimming pancakes. From yep. <laughs> so that's that. 
Um, so the first question here, and we'll try to get to as many of these as we can. And if we can't get to all of them, uh, you know, people can email or, or right. hit up your website. But um, does light pollution have a harmful impact on turtles or even noise, noise pollution in urban areas? I have not heard noise pollution. I have heard with sea turtles and nesting and baby turtles being attracted to um, the lights along um, the coast. I don't do sea turtles. I'm not a coastal person, obviously, um, but I have heard of, of baby sea turtles being disoriented for things like porch lights like that. I have not off the top of my head. I'm sure there's something out there that I'm just not thinking of, but I've not heard of anything for um, freshwater turtles. Awesome. Um, next up we have, do Texas turtles hibernate? If, if so, where? Sure. Um, a lot of the turtle species we have here range to the north of us and are actually really, really hardy. Uh, the freshwater turtles like sliders and cooters will bury themselves deep down in the mud. Uh, the Texas tortoises will find a little form or like a little um, area where they can nestle in. They don't dig a burrow like the other gopher tortoises, uh, but they stay, you know, in a nice little uh, shallow form. Um, they can, box turtles can nestle down pretty deep in leaf debris and litter, um, leaf litter and can get down pretty deep to hibernate. So uh, we did get a, quite a few questions from this past ice storm, what was it last year, and any ice storm, and all the freshwater turtles from what we were able to observe fared just fine. Um, even the Texas tortoises, I was concerned for the Texas tortoises because they don't live so far north and they wouldn't be used to the cold, but it looks like um, many, plenty of them survived. Anything that probably died was already compromised uh, going into it. So yeah, they do just fine in our cold whether um, nestled down in the mud or muck. Um, there's even been, we can even have seen sliders and turtles uh, swimming under the ice, um, poking their head out, getting air from under the ice and little air bubbles. And then they have other ways of, of breathing. And with the water oxygen in the water so low, they need a lot less oxygen and their heart rate slows down a lot to get them through the, the winter. There's a long answer for you. No, that's, that's great info, so good to have. Um, when you were talking about moving turtles and putting them back in the, like the same pond or area, this person simply asked, you know, why is it important to release the turtle in the same pond or area? Sure, everything everything has a home range. Um, box turtles have a smaller home range. Snakes, just about everything is used to their neighborhood, used to where they're being. Uh, sliders are a lot more versatile in being moved around. Um, sometimes if you release it in the area, it, they may not have adequate food or and other danger or whatever reason, there's various things, they may not have mates, there's all kinds of factors, but they kind of, they, they know their neighborhood, they know where they're going, they kind of know what they're doing, so it's great to keep everything in that vicinity, like especially box turtles don't do well, typically don't do well translocated. And this is a follow-up kind of for my own information on that same um, topic is, do turtles in waterways set up territories at all? I mean, you always yeah. see them basking out all in the same log and everything, but do they have established territories? Yeah, uh, some of them do like the same spot. Some of them you'll find in the same spot year after year. Um, they do move. So there has been radio studies done of how far turtle has traveled. Um, our president um, of our organization, uh, marked, measured, and weighed and collected data on one turtle one year, and then um, it was identified on INAT upstream, uh, you know, a couple miles upstream years later. So they do have the area that they hang out and where they like to go, and everyone has their kind of own little spots. Like I said, it varies, and each species is different. Perfect. Um, this next question is not so much a question, but a comment, and since we weren't talking about sea turtles, I'll just hit it really quickly, but so apparently today, uh, TPW set D said that at Galveston Island State Park, they found a Kemp Ridley sea turtle nest with 107 eggs. The yeah. first time they've found one since 2012. So everybody's yeah. pretty excited about that. Very cool. Our, our secretary, Sal Shabetta, does a lot of uh, sea turtle work and has gone out there for many years helping on the sea turtle side of things. Excellent. This next one, I think you hit on already, but it makes sure there's not anything else to add is um, you know, how well do our native turtles handle the cold? And did you see any effects from winter storm Uri? Right, yeah, that was, that was a big question we got. 
I, I think they did just fine. I had no worries. Uh, snow is very insulating. They know what to do. Like I said, a lot of these species range far north. Common snapping turtles occur all the way up into Canada, so they can handle it. They're really, really tough. Um, I've even observed a released Florida red belly cooter um, that was a release pet that survived the ice storm. And as soon as we were able to go out to go see what turtles were out basking, I mean, turtles were basking probably 48 hours after we thawed out. We immediately went out looking to see if we saw anything or what kind of behavior um, they would be doing post that um, ice storm. And yeah, red melanistic, sl melanistic sliders were out basking and we saw, you know, released pets out basking. So they seem to do just fine, just from what we were able to observe. Awesome, that's good news. Yeah. Um, do the yellow mud turtles in Texas estivate on land during the warmer months? Yes, <laughs> they will dig down in the mud and the, the water will dry up around those cattle tanks and get buried down real deep and hang out there until those big heavy rainstorms come and then they move on, go find food, water, mate, and do their thing. Short answer. Awesome. Um, the next one is, I know habitat loss has a, a, impacted the three-toed box turtles, but are there other issues affecting populations? Sure, ornate box turtles, three-toed box turtles, um, the chicken turtle, lots of turtles I'm not able to get to in this sort of a talk or that require a lot more in detail. Um, habitat loss is a big one for a lot of different species in Texas and across the globe. Our sliders and our cooters seem to do okay with urbanization better than others. Again, it just depends on the species of turtle and what we're dealing with, yeah. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. definitely a problem. Yeah. Um, do turtles practice mutual grooming, such as leech removal or comforting yeah. touch? <laughs> they do. They will eat leeches off each other. We have even seen them eating algae off the back of each other. We've seen fish uh, swim up and eat algae and parasites off the outside of turtles. So there is that um, relationship um, with, like I said, fish and other turtles. All right, looks like we have one more question for now. Um, can a box turtle that's been kept in a large terrarium for 20 years and is in good shape be put into the wild or proper backyard environment? Once it's that, lo that long, it shouldn't be going in the wild. You should never release anything. There's also the, the risk of diseases. But what I've had to do and what I've seen people do with these wayward box turtles or turtles that can't be released is building a very large outdoor enclosure for them and keeping them outside all year round is gonna be a really good thing from going inside to outside. Um, they sh should be able to make a cold winter. It is hard for me to say. I'm not a veterinarian nor, you know, knowing the specifics of it, but if you build them an outdoor enclosure, a very secure outdoor enclosure, they can probably do a lot better than they would inside in general. Yeah. We never recommend uh, releasing. Yeah, never want to release. Even even captive bred babies that have been captive bred, there's a huge risk of genetic stuff to native populations. So, best to keep everything uh, captive, captive, and leave wild things wild. Okay, one more here. Um, this is a, a term question. Uh, you mentioned that turtles hibernate, but they were under the impression that they brumate. It's uh -huh. jargon. It's jargon yeah. over many, many years. It depends on which book you look at and it's everyone's preference. It, it kind of, it's one of those things, doesn't matter. Some people want to be picky and uh, finicky on brumate versus hibernate. Um, hibernation has typically been used for things like mammals and reptiles typically brumate. It's kind of one of those, you know, changes in, in literature and, and jargon over the many years. Excellent. And then just looking through the chat here, not the Q&A, it looks like there were tons of, you know, everybody really enjoyed your talk. A lot of great information here. Um, and it looks like one just popped up here that what's the best way to contact you um, if you have a turtle issue? And so sure. TexasTurtles.org. Our website is on there. Our website is turtlesoftexas at gmail.com. Um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, email is pretty much the best way. And then we can we can talk further from there on case by case basis. A lot of this stuff is case by case basis for, for many things. Cause like I said, someone um, has helped a Russian tortoise or a pet tortoise cross the road doing the best intention, not realizing that it was a pet. So it's stuff like I said, all kinds of unique situations for all of it. Perfect. Well, it looks like we got to everyone's questions. Um, so I just wanna say thank you for joining us today. It was an excellent presentation. Um, I learned a lot. Um, so thank you, Viviana, for joining us and um, being
being part of the Wild Neighbors. Thank you guys very much. It was wonderful.